Right, I'm really looking forward to today's walk in industrial history because I'm going to track, check out some new territory that I've never looked at before. And you don't usually think of Bury in Lancashire or Greater Manchester these days when it comes to coal mining, but it did have its own mining industry and quite early as well. And what we're going to check out today is Lomax Wood Colliery. Me and Tussie are going to go and have a look because there was a, a potentially a a very near miss of a, a bad mining disaster there, 1833 or 1834, off the top of my head I think it's 1834, where they hauled into some old workings while there was 20 odd people underground and there was an inundation. And it's quite a thrilling story to be honest with you, uh, and I'll not spoil it for you till we get there. So we're off now to Bury, is it Berry? Is it Bury? Bowie? Bowie? Anyway, come along. <laughs> Lobby, <laughs> lobby, your lobby gobblers. Yes. <laughs> so today we're down towards Greater Manchester. Now I did say Bury, but Derek Schofield's put me right, and perhaps we're actually in Haywood. But nevertheless, we're between Bury and Haywood. And back in 1834, they reckoned it was Bury. But we're going to this point here, this great big bend on the River Roach. And you can see the big um, field marker is Fairfield Hospital. So we're getting up the M66 here at the Bury Turnoff. I'm going up through Pym Hall. And this is our location we're interested in, near Pretty Wood. So how many times have you all passed by and not realised what it was? And I was much the same when I used to visit my brother and sister-in-law in Haywood. This here opposite, opposite Pretty Wood, and this scar going down the field is Lomax Wood Colliery Lane. That was the old pit road. It's hard to follow now, but you can see where it's full of reeds. And then this is where it starts to get a little bit sort of um, difficult to follow. There was a, an old lodge along here, and then that is a very steep bank, a real steep bank. Uh, and we struggled to find exactly where the pit was. And there used to be a sandstone quarry here as well, as you'll see on the first Ordnance Survey map. But it looks like that is the pumping shaft. Now, on the other side, we've got Bridge Hall Mills. Now, at one time, they claimed to be the biggest paper mill in the country. I know one newspaper report said the world. And there was a big accident there in 1915, where part of the new mill that was being built collapsed and killed eight people. And a lot of the colliery sites... You see where all the trees are by the side of the river here? Well, this used to be a, a railway siding. M must have been for the mill, I suppose. Uh, and there was all goods yards and goods sheds round about here, right where the pit was. Obviously, again, for the, for the mill. And the mill was built all by the side of this river here when you look at the, uh, the 1915 through 1920 map. Yeah, it looks like the pit lodge was sort of in this area somewhere uh, and the engine pit was further down. It must have been near the bank because, as I say, this was a quarry here. Well, we're going to quarry down to the bottom, aren't they? And everything's been disturbed. That is possibly the site that it puts on the Coal Authority inter uh, Interactive Viewer as the old pumping pit from, uh, from Lomax Wood. And paper mills are notorious for being the most greedy for water. So, are they getting water out the old pit? I'd like to show you two things also before we come to that conclusion. There and here, these are mounds sticking up out the field. And this one's locked and they look like shafts, but they're actually modern concrete segment uh, manholes. And that goes down about 30 feet. And obviously that's a mystery because it's locked. And there are two, two paths across the river. You've got what looks to be coming out the ground here, Possibly, and I'm saying possibly because I can't say it is for definitely, but where the old pumping shaft for Lomax Wood was. And here you can see another pipe going across the river, and that's where we sit, me and Tussie talking. Um, so what are these? Are these supplying water as well to the mill? Maybe we'll find out. Maybe somebody knows. 
as you can see, it drops away really steeply. And round about here was the old pit lodge. And there was the uh, sandstone quarry on this side, obviously down here. You can't see now because of the, the foliage. And there was also a sandstone quarry on the other side. And you can see one black pipe going across there. And obviously you've got this big pipe bringing water across here and now a footbridge. And you can see the foundations of the old mill there as well. Now it's all in uh, new units. And here we've got the, the other lane that comes down from Lower Lomax. And Margaret was recalling when she was a kid uh, and her dad came down here with an old pram getting coal. Well, the coal does come to the surface, the lower mountain and the lower foot and the upper foot crop out. But there's a big geological fault that cuts off the Lomax wood colliery. But the old 1840 map does show this lane on going straight down to the pit. And there were being two shafts, one a pumping shaft or a coal winding shaft as well. So it's still a bit of a mystery. No plans have turned up. So we're, we're still trying to unravel the site. Perhaps we never will fully unravel it. So here we are then on the first ordnance survey sheet. So we're looking at a time period between 1844 and 1848 thereabouts. And we've got this very defined, as you can see, bend in the River Roach that always gives the game away whereabouts we are. Apart from that, the area's a bit more sparse back then, isn't it? And here we are. This is, can you see the Lomax wood? pit road and there quite clearly shows the colliery there and this coal pit here which again must be part of the Lomax wood colliery the newspaper report said that there was two shafts now if we get back to the turnpike road because we have a story on there it's the sudden bridge and bury trust and this is where the nine-year-old lad by the name of brown got squashed by the boiler now on the video again i, I keep getting my dates mixed up um call it old age on the video, I think I say it was 1833. Well, the accident occurred in 1843 in this very spot, going down this bank with a boiler. But we, we'll get into that later on in a little bit more detail. But it's the Sudden Bridge and the Bury Trust is that turnpike. And we've got the Bridge Hall paper mill there in situ at the time. And if you look, they've got a gasometer. So they've got their own plant for producing gas for lighting as well. So not only will they need coal for any steam engines, boilers, they're also going to need coal to produce, well, they're using coal to produce their own lighting as well. So there's two ways down to the pit. There's a pit lane that's obvious that we follow, me and Tussie down there, that you kind of lose. Can you see? There's the lodge and there's the actual main pit what looks to be the main pit there and way into the sandstone quarry at the bottom and we've got the other coal pit down there and the other way in is down this lane that you can still follow which goes past lower lomax and this is where margaret said her dad used to come and get coal so we know that that lane goes down a steep hill down to the riverside so obviously the lomax wood was down by the riverside wasn't it you know as well uh, but now it's all full of trees and the site changed many many times See, there's not a lot of infrastructure to see, is there really? And this road down the bank must have been very, very steep. And see, there's just those buildings there. Is that the shaft? But at any rate, you can see the retaining wall there uh, and then into the quarry. And if we come up to the second shaft, there's a little bit of infrastructure. It's hard to tell what that actually is around the river bank, but it plainly shows the coal shaft there. But all this area would have been destroyed, as we'll see on the later photograph, by the, the rails and the goods sheds that were put there. And this is the map that was surveyed between 1889 and 1891. And you can see now that the paper mill has totally taken over that side of the river there. The pit has been obliterated. There's a pit road. There's nothing left of it really. This is all goods sheds now. And this is the, uh, the railway sidings back to the uh, Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway. And this is 1928, and you can see the mill's changed again, probably following the disaster. And we can see the old pit road coming down here. There looks to be a little bit of uh, perhaps what was left of the old there. And this is the footbridge that we can see Tussie coming across, and this is roughly where the green pipe comes out of now. So that's how we look at the, the different maps and how the area's changed over the years. So let's get on the ground now and have a, a good look around the place. Oh, 
Well, the amount of times I've passed here, and this is actually the Lomax Wood Colliery Lane End. This is a, the pit road. And another interesting thing happened the year before the disaster in this spot. I'll tell you more. Fairfield Hospital. Oh, yeah. yeah. And for an added bit of history today, Tuss is in his pit vest. Genuine age craft, so that's for sale. And he's it's a mock vest. <laughs> yeah. I've got the underpants to match, but I'm not wearing them. <laughs> and there were quite a lot happened round Bury around about the 1830s. There was a large party of people from Bury went on an excursion on a, a steam packet, well a steamboat called the, the Rossy Castle. It was an old paddle steamer which set out from Liverpool to go to Bowmaris. Is that how you pronounce it? Bowmaris yeah. on Anglesey. Yeah. Bowmaris. Uh, and it, it sank. I forget how many it killed now, but a lot were from Bury. We're going to do a video on it. But there was two local coal owners on. There was John Duckworth from Shuttleworth, and John survived, but his wife he got killed. And there was Benjamin. I get mixed up. Benjamin or Robert Lee from the Hogs Head Colliery, and, and he di he actually died. But it, I think there's something in the Bury Cemetery about the people. A lot of them that were from Bury that got on this uh, Rossy Castle boat and a bloke's on a book on it. But anyway, that was 1831. On this turnpike road here, which was the Haywood to Bury turnpike. Now, it, how long did you say they'd been working on it, Tussie? Sure, the article said um, rather seven or nine years. Seven or nine years, mm. yeah. Well, they were bringing a great big boiler across. Um, we've got it written down at home which mill it was destined for. But they were bringing a boiler down and they got to the top of the hill here and there were 17 horses pulling it and they reckon about... 19 tonnes were boiler. 19 tonnes. Yeah. And there was about 50 odd people watching it or gathered round. Now, as they were weighing up which was the best way to bring it down the road, um, they set off and the wheels sunk into the road and the boiler fell off and killed a lad called John Brown, who was nine years old. Definitely not the sort of hat you want to be wearing. No, definitely not. <laughs> and it took about three quarters of an hour to get him out. But another interesting thing, it said the road was already £8,000 in debt, and it, yeah. it charged excessive tolls anyway. But that happened here at this road end, because the newspaper report says at the end of Lomax Colliery Road End. So we're going to have a wander down the old pit road and see what we can find of the old pit. So. We're kind of on the fly today, if you will. We're shooting from the hip with whatever we might find. And can I just add, imp pit brilliant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, looking back, this looks like the old pit road down here, all overgrown and reedy. Uh, and looking at the, the old 1844 map, I'll show you better on that, on, on cam, you know, I'll do a proper camera shot of it. It's opposite the old bridge paper, the old bridge old paper mill. Near a, an old sandstone quarry and it shows that there's a lodge there so they must have had a steam engine. Well, they had a water wheel. Uh, so, we're looking for an area where there's a lodge and see if there's anything left of the pit head buildings. It's obviously bait time. Mm. What do you want? What's them? Cheese and onion. What do you want? Cheese and onion. I love the salted <laughs> Why don't you bring two packets of cheese and onion? Because there's only one. <laughs> That's just been put to wait that. Okay. Well, there's that mound in the field there, isn't there? We've come to find a different road down, uh, and thankfully we have. So when we were discussing the boiler, 19 tonnes, does anybody know if that's normal for a boiler? Do you reckon it's big tussy, don't you? Yeah, feel, feel way to that boiler. <laughs> Just that there was one up in the Lake District, and I'm trying to think of the name of the mine at, at Keswick, um, to the mine on the side of Derwent Water, and reading the account of it, it took them nearly a week to get it, from the railway station all the way up past through Grange and back on the other side of Derwent Water a week nearly and also there was um, a boiler obviously on the top of Hamilton Hill up with the golf balls where they are at the Coppola pit and Big John did talk to a lady who remembered her mother 
talking of a great deal of horses getting the, that baler up the hill and that could have took over a week as well. There were massive things to drag around and obviously a very unstable load and too unstable for that road there because it just sunk. Poor lad, nine year old. hardest pitch to find. We're backwards and forwards but you can see the foliage and going off Google Earth and the maps there's a black pipe across the river roughly where the pit was but it, you can see there's no sign of it perhaps for the wrong time of year and all. We look up there this is the area that it shows it is and a quarry but there's no sign of the quarry neither. Right, try as we might, we've looked high and low up and down this valley uh, and like I said, perhaps it's the wrong time of year but Lomax Wood Colliery was around about here Now, the, the account back to the 1830s, back, I think it's 1834 talks about the pit working on two levels Sadly, the, um, the reporter hasn't got his information brilliant but he said they've worked all the upper levels out and two shafts have been sunk to the lower levels and we've looked all over Adam, haven't we, and we can't yeah. find any there's supposed to be a, a pit here, a quarry, but if you look on the later maps, there was good sheds and everything and railway sidings here, so that's possibly obliterated it all. But back in 1834, the Lomax Wood Colliery was round about here, and they were working, we don't know which seam yet, I'll explain that on the geological survey, but a guy named Taylor was, was coiling, he was hewing, and there was about 23 of them underground at the time, and he put his pick into some old workings that nobody knew about. So if they were working in 1833, those workings must have been really old and before living memory, so it shows how far back mining went. Any anyway, road, it says, when he put his pick through in the workings, it sounded like, what did it say, roaring thunder? Uh, peeling thunder. Peeling thunder, peeling thunder, yeah. yeah. Peeling thunder. And a torrent of water came rushing into the, into the pit. And the guy that was working, Taylor, it drove him out of his, it said, called it a bay, so they called the wark a bay around Bury. It sent him down the, down the wark, down the bay, and he caught hold of a prop. Now, he, he was working naked. If you look at stuff from back then, they all seem to work naked. At least us, he's got his vest on. Now, the water completely inundated the workings. It, it pushed stone, tubs, everything. Luckily, six men got washed to the pit bottom, and they managed to wind them up. But the rest of them, was stuck underground and it was hoped that they got to a higher level. So our, our hero Taylor was clinging to a prop for over three hours. Now on the pit top, which is somewhere around here, we can sort of imagine the scene, all the local people and the, the mothers, fathers, wives of people that worked here, uh, could even be husbands back in 1833, couldn't it? Husbands of workers that worked here. They gathered on the pit top and it was quite a distressing scene. Uh, because he thought that these men were drowned, there was no look for them. And it appears from the, uh, from the report that there could possibly have been a water level out to the river. And it said they'd just completed the tunnel the day before. And after about three hours, one guy managed to get up the tunnel, and he had to come back out again because he couldn't get. And he went in again, made another attempt with just his nostrils sticking out of the water. So you can imagine he possibly didn't have much of a light. And he managed to get in and he, he, he dragged some of the miners out by hand. And obviously they were in the dark, they'd lost the light. So this guy who's unmentioned went in and he heroically saved these 17 men. And Taylor was found three hours later, still clung to this prop, absolutely freezing cold. So that's what happened in Bury in 1833, a little bit of mining history for you. And I wish we could have sat on the pit top knowing and, and actually found it. But it says there was two pits joined together, so we're going to have another wander back up the burn, up the, up the river, to see if we can find the other pit. We have an idea where it might be. Do you think they might have got a snap note for that ordeal? Early ride? <laughs> <laughs> Aye. Perhaps Dennis would have given them a watch of paper. 
You don't know what a watch of paper is? You get get a sharp blaze for working wet. Oh right, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, silly me. <laughs> <laughs> back home and we're going to analyse some of the data that we found on our field study uh, and also because I've put something up on our page we've had other information given us. Ken Harris helped us out a little bit with some of the geolog geological surveys, he's put a little bit more input into that and Jack Nadine's also given us a few bits and bats and dates and a little bit more info on the pit that we didn't already know. So all in all to say we don't know a great deal about the pit quite a lot has come in so we'll have a look at some of the stuff some of the data uh, and look a bit deeper into some of the geology. So we found a more modern sheet of the Manchester Bury area that shows the, the geology in a bigger scale but again we're still in the dark as I'll show you now. So to try and explain the geology a, a bit a little bit and I'm not trying to teach some of you to suck eggs but not everybody fully understands the geology. So we're on the uh, British Geological Survey and it's a, the geological survey map of uh, Manchester. I think it's sheet 86 if you want to look it up. But basically, th this section is showing a big slice, like a slice of a cake, if you will, right through the, the earth. Um, and this particular section is the area that we're interested in, round about Bury, Haywood. And the section shows between the Arley Coal Seam and the Sandrock Coal Seam which is, um, well, on here it's a couple of inches, but from the Arley down to the upper mountain is about 900 feet, and it's something similar from the lower mountain down to the sand rock coal. Lots of geological faults have made the, this area change, so where the Arley coal might be up here, another fault might knock it down here. Obviously the strata is exactly the same, it just, it moves, <laughs> it, it moves sequentially. So the Arley mine is pre prevalent all over Burnley, where it's really fantastic house coal. It really is premier coal. It's known as the Silkstone. I'm sure it is uh, in, in Yorkshire. Now, in Rochdale, it's known as the Royale. So they were at the Royale coal. And in Bury, it's also called the Dogshaw mine, the Dogshaw coal. In Lancashire, they tend to call coal seams mines. So it's the upper mountain mine, the pasture mine. Now we know we're certainly below the Isle of Mine where we're looking for and we're looking around about the area of the lower mountain mine and the upper mountain mine. This is the area we think that Lomax Wood was work, it was uh, exploiting. It's difficult to say because all the coal seams are concealed on the ge geological survey map. They've been thrown down by geological faults. I'll show you. Now this is a cross section across the geological map running North, sort of north to south, across the Roach, up to the M62 motorway. And can you see how the geological faults affect the strata, how it throws it and displaces it? This, by the way, is known as a trough fault. So that's what we're dealing with, that the, the faults have occurred uh, and thrown the coal to a different location within the strata. So here we have the area of the colliery. Here's the bend in the River Roach. There's the main road. Now, the problem we have is we haven't got a plan of the pit to show exactly where it worked. But what we can see is these faults dissecting the area. Now, on the other side of the fault, we've got the lower mountain mine cropping out there. The lower foot, and I'm told the upper foot also crops out. So these are where Marjorie's father would have been getting coal from the outcrop. So we're exactly in relation to the faults. Was the Lomax wood shaft, was it on the downside of the fault? 
See the fault line there? And you can see this little mark. That tells you that this area is the down throw side of the fault. So that lower mountain mine is thrown down. Again, another fault traversing the other way. And the down throw side is to that. So was this the area that Lomax Wood Colliery was working? Or was it this area? Without plans, we honestly don't know. If it was working on this side, uh, the, the lower mountain sort of crops out the shafts wouldn't have been very deep um or the shafts went down to the sand rock which is an awful long way so whether this side of the fault work in this this coal again we're not unsure of the dip of the strata we know further north it dips at one in nine towards the south so we can't say for definite exactly whereabouts the lomax wood workings were we'll just have a look on dickinson's map so here we are, here's Joseph Dickinson's map, generally thought to be drawn more or less around the 1860s. And Joseph was the uh, the first mines inspector for the Manchester district. And he recorded a lot of the colliers that he visited. So there we are, we've got the bend in the river there. And we can see Lomax Wood Colliery. Now can you see this dotted line? Is that one of the faults? Now, Dickinson writes things on, but it's very difficult to tell exactly what he says in this particular area. Uh, a lot of his stuff's very busy, the maps are busy, but he shows the upper foot coal there cropping out, and he calls it the three-quarter. Now, the three-quarter was sometimes the uh, referred to the sand rock coal. Let's see if we can blow it up a little bit. So we've blown it up, and he does show the engine pit there he calls that the pumping pit. That looks like the pumping pit, doesn't it? Uh, now then, what does that say? Above the three-quarter coal. It's hard to tell exactly what he's saying there. No, and even by blowing it up, we can't really see. Uh, it just sees rock something above three-quarter coal. The upper foot, three-quarter there. Um... Is he talking about the sandstone quarry that is above the three-quarter coal, possibly? And he doesn't really say what that coal pit is down to. It's difficult to read. So it looks like there's possibly a bit of a seam section there. But it's difficult to read, almost impossible. Never mind. So we're still a little bit in the dark as to which coal the pit worked. So... Like I said, it's not entirely conclusive, isn't the geological survey? And I wanted to look at that really so we could perhaps understand the newspaper report better of um, how the accident happened and how the rescue went on. But we don't know. So we're going to have to use our imagination or just let sleeping dogs lie. So what else do we know about the colliery then? Well, Jack sent us uh, a newspaper cut in from 1819 that was the partnership being dissolved and it was the partnership between Bamford and Co at Lomax Wood Colliery being dissolved in, eight, in March 1819, May 1819. Now we know later on that the pit was owned by Bamford, Clegg and Haig and they ran it for a good number of years. Yeah and that, that partnership carried on until 1843 when uh, it was dissolved because Mr. Clegg had died and he was replaced by a guy named Livesey. Now we know also that the manager of the pit for a good number of years was a guy called, now either Thomas Dawson or John Dawson, he's called, <laughs> he's called Thomas in one time and John at another time. And I'm not going to say was he John Thomas, <laughs> but anyway, he was the manager for a long time. And we get introduced to him in 1833, the year before the inundation. Um, where there's a bit of a court case going on, which is interesting. In the March of 1833, there was a court case involving the pit as well. Uh, and it was Haig and others against Chadwick. Now, Chadwick had owned a cotton mill, we don't know which one, between Bury and Haywood. And they'd been buying coal from Lomax Wood Colliery. And in the year 1829 and 1830, they bought over 270 odd pounds worth and X amount of shillings worth of coal from Lomax Wood. And they'd paid it in dribs and drabs. However, there was an outstanding balance of over 76, 76 pounds. And that hadn't been paid. But in the meantime, Mr Chadwick had gone bust. Now, two assignees that had been uh, assigned to the bankruptcy, they were Edward Taylor and James Walker. And James Walker were Bury's first MP. And they were now in charge of finances, keeping the mill going, 
with Mr Chadwick running it, hopefully to pay off the creditors. Now then, they also purchased coal from the pit and they said that they give Chadwick the right to buy coal on their credit. Now, Thomas, he said that, no, 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 I dealt with Mr Chadwick, that's who I was dealing with. But when the case came to court, it was Walker and Taylor that made sure that it was Chadwick that owed the money because they reckoned that they said that his evidence would mean that the charge was kind of dropped or lessened. Uh, and as it was, that's exactly what happened. I suppose it's nothing to do with him being the MP, is it? But the case was dropped and kicked out of court, so Low Maxwood was down, well, 70 odd pound on coal revenues, 40 odd pound on coal revenues, wasn't it? Now that was the year before the disaster. So let's get to the disaster then. And we know for a certain that the colliery had been working since before 1819 for an unknown time, because that partnership had been dissolved then. And we can see all old shafts around that area. Now the newspaper report said that they'd been working on different levels and all the upper levels had been worked out and they'd sunk shafts down to the lower level. And the lower level was connected to the upper level. It also said there was two mines. Well, maybe it could be a downcast shaft and an upcast shaft in different areas. And we've seen, haven't we, that there's one shaft where the green pipe comes out of and then there's the engine pumping shaft near the, the actual pit lane. So there are two shafts. Do they class that as two pits? And also, as the, uh, the narrative goes on, it said that they remembered a tunnel that communicated and that there could be a way out there and a way where the water was getting out. So is there an old water level from old workings on one side of the fault where they'd worked things out and then they've drove a drift through to connect with the new workings from the shafts? We just don't know. And it's irritating that I don't know. I'd like to really see a plan. Um, so I could really explain this pop proper. But let's get into the events that day when Mr. Taylor, whatever his first name was, went down the pit, took all his clothes off and started hewing. And that's another thing you might say, why did he have nout on? Well, today is one of the hottest days of the year so far. And like, where's Morgan? Well, it, which side of the river, he'd love jumping in that river. It's too hot for him. And so a lot of colliers used to work naked because the pits were that hot, especially the deep pits around Manchester and Wigan and especially down in the Kent coal field, people worked with hardly anything on. It was going on for 90 to 100 degrees, but it wasn't 90 to 100 degrees in Lomax Wood or anywhere else around Rochdale or Rosendale at that time, but it was a fashion apparently. When you read Shaftesbury's 1840 report and you look at some of the pictures in there, it shows some of the guys, especially the bloke at Roscoe's Colliery and another one at Rainhow, I think it is, working naked. And it was a fashion, fashion sense. That's why they worked without on. Don't ask me how they did it. I mean, I've worked with just shorts on in low seams and it, you get cut to ribbons. But anyway, that's why he was working naked. Calling Lazenby, eh? I wish. <laughs> Just black shale really. But now, I'm, let's get back to what we were talking about. And actually I've got the date wrong, but there's nothing new on that. It was the 21st of November that the accident happened. And the newspaper says that all the upper oars had been worked out and they now were sunk shafts to the bottom oars, <laughs> to reach the bottom levels. So we've got Taylor, and he's hewing away. And it looks as though they were heading straight for all workings they knew nothing about. And he mightn't even have put his pick through into all workings. It's just that the barrier of coal needed to be reduced that much that the force, thousands of tons really of water on the other side of that barrier, forced through. And that's what the noise was like, a tremendous explosion it said. And it carried on as the water came in, like Tussie said, like peals of thunder. Now Taylor was washed away from the coal face and he got hold of that prop and he clung <laughs> with all his might to that prop because had he let loose, it had been washed out down and it said he'd been he would have been taken down the tunnel of the engine pit and dashed to pieces. Now, six others in the vicinity, they were washed into the pit bottom, which is the difference between washed into the pit bottom and down the tunnel of the engine pit. And it says that they were immediately wound to safety. So you've now got 17 men left underground. 17 men, boys, doesn't say if there was any lasses amongst them, we don't know. 
So we can imagine the scene on the pit top and I didn't portray that very good the other day. It was a cold November day. You've got husbands, wives, mothers, neighbours, um, interested people gathered around there. It's just like any other mining incident that happened, any other mining catastrophe, any catastrophe, people flocked to it, but especially those who were involved, whose loved ones are left underground. The anxiety is unbelievable because there they are just below your feet, but you can't get to them. The reporter said it was a lamentable scene on the surface with mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, anxious for the loved ones. But they did realize the only hope that they had was that water would subside, the men could get to higher ground and that this tunnel that we don't really understand would drain off some of the water and if the men got to higher ground enough water might drain off for them to be able to get into the pit. Now I think it was around about three hours later that they then tried to enter the pit and they tried many many fruitless efforts, they kept getting pushed back and it's only a small report in the paper but really try to imagine what it must have been like in an enclosed space with all that water, uh, all the anxiety, the hype, the, um, the adrenaline rushing. What would it really have been like? It takes them just sitting down and thinking about what exactly happened that day down by the river at Lomax Wood, doesn't it? But they didn't give up. Repeated efforts, repeated efforts, and then one man, and he's not even named. Now then, if he'd have been a general, sat on a horse at some battle, well, about a mile away from a battle, we'd all have learned about him at school, wouldn't we? But this guy isn't even named. And with repeated efforts, he finally got his way up that drainage tunnel. We don't know how high it was, but what we do know is, only his nostrils and his mouth were out of the water. So perhaps, he had his head up like that to the roof. How was he illuminating? What sort of a light did he have, if any? And if you've ever been in that sort of position in cold, deep water in a dark place, uh, it takes quite a lot of nerve to do what that guy did. And he was shouting as he went up the tunnel because there were still, as it says, torrents of water going along, you know, on the other side of where he was. And eventually he got a reply for his shouts. The, the other men were there. Were they in the dark? Did they have a light? We don't know. But he grabbed all of it, he got his hand and extended it and he managed to reach one of the trapped men. They must have been trying to get to him as well as they heard his voice. And he managed to pull him towards him and get him out. Now once he got the first man out, again after that, that endurance he'd had in a watery grave, he still had to get down that tunnel that there was hardly any breathing room in. Again, that would have been an ordeal. And I'll tell you now, that water's freezing. If you ever go in any old mines up to here, whoa, it takes your breath away. And then one by one, they managed to get them all out and wound them to safety. And it, the reporter says, it's hard to describe the feeling and, and the sense of relief and the shows of delight that there was when the last man reached the surface. But maybe you can guess, I mean, in the last 10, 15 years, we've had a couple of rescues. There was, there was the one in America, the name of the pit escapes, you know, where they were trapped underground for quite a few days and they, they dug that shaft down to them, didn't they? And got them all up. I think that's about 20 years ago now after that explosion. And the, there was the one in Chile. Now, everybody must remember that one in Chile where they sunk the shaft. And weren't all the, the TV companies from around the world present as they started getting them out of the mine? Well, they were in America as well. And the joy at having the loved ones return to them from certain death. So that was the 21st of November in 1834 at Heap between Bury and Haywood. And again, you don't learn that at school. But let's get a bit more about the pit and what happened at the end of the pit road with the poor John Brown that was killed by the boiler. Now, the accident happened again in November, but this time November of 1843. Um, I think it was the 26th and the inquest was held the day after at the Jolly Carters and that must have been near the top of the hill where the accident sort of started because the guy whose pub it was said that um, he'd witnessed the start of the accident from start to finish kind of thing. He went out to see the blokes with the, uh, with the boiler before they set off down the hill. Now what is interesting as well 
The newspaper reporter applied to the coroner for the right to go and sit in at the inquest uh, and he got it, not a problem. But one of the jurors objected to him. Now the reporter went in, sat by the window at the pub, minding his own business and taking notes, but there was an objection to him being there. I wonder why. Never mind. The boiler had been made by Thomas Hill, his company in Haywood, and it was being transported and we don't know which mill it was being transported to but they stopped outside the Jolly Carters to uh, weigh up which was the best part of the road to go down now that tells you for a start that the turnpike roads weren't really up to much the rest of the report tells us that as well so they were trying to weigh up which is the best way to get down which is the safest, which is going to be the most solid road now can you imagine if you were a young'un how excited you'd be to see this massive boiler going along the road with 17 horses pulling it, it would have been well exciting. You and all your mates would have been out following it, wouldn't you, running at the side of it. And no doubt people have come out of their houses to look at it as well. And that is how accidents happen. Now they set off down the hill with the cart and it seems that all they'd done to mend the road and make it good was just put a lot of gravel and muck over bog. Yeah, it was a very femur job and it, the cart didn't go, the, the wagon didn't go that far before it sunk. It said the offside wheels sunk, so it must have gone that side. And as it did, well, the boiler rolled off. So they decided to take the middle route, middle for diddle. And as they set off, as I say, that boiler rolled off. And as John, or his, uh, perhaps with his mates, were running at the side of it, he got caught. It wouldn't just have fallen off it, how much far would that boiler have rolled and it took them nearly three quarters of an hour to get poor young John out of it, it oh, in the middle of the road like that with all those people perhaps his parents around what a horrendous thing to happen on such an exciting day now the local surveyor was a guy named John Leach and he sort of said well he wished that before they took the boiler along they'd come and talk to him because he would have told them do not use this road go somewhere else and the last time we find Lomax Wood is in 1845 and again it, it's on about the manager John Dawson. Now as we said earlier the, the partnership between Bamford, Haig and Clegg got dissolved in 1843 because Mr Clegg had died and he got replaced by a guy called Livesey. Now it looks as though Livesey didn't really like John Dawson, John or Thomas Dawson um, and he wanted particularly to get involved in the running of the pit. He wasn't happy just to be a, a partner of the owners. He seemed to get himself really involved. And it looks like he particularly targeted John. Now, by this time, John was getting old uh, and he'd been, in the charge, he'd been in charge of the pit for many years. And it come, came to it that for whatever reason we don't know, John Dawson got sacked. And when he'd been dismissed, Livesy started going through the accounts and he found a discrepancy. Now in May of 1842, John Dawson, on behalf of the company, had paid eight pound and two shilling poor law rates. Now poor law was today what we call business rates and he paid them to a Mr. Wilsonholm who had given him a written receipt. It was Mr. Wilsonholm's job to collect the poor law. Now a year later, in 1843, could have been March this time, the same sum was paid and a receipt or a, an invoice was given. Now then, it was later discovered or charged that the first signature was a forgery, that John had forged the signature and obviously the implication being that he kept the money for himself. Now when it all came to court, it turned out that Mr. Wilson, whom had at least five or six other members of his family that would collect the poor law on his behalf because it was a busy time, he couldn't do it all himself. And also, the day that it was collected from Lomax Wood, again, it was a busy day. So the jury sort of said, after just a few minutes, that they found nothing wrong in John Dawson. He was completely innocent. And he was supposed to stand charge, actually, uh, the day, well, the same day, on embezzlement. But they cut the day short, because it was getting late, and he stood again the day after. And that didn't even get... Um, there was no trial to answer with that because there was no evidence against him. But we do get a lovely picture of John because the court reporter says that he was a respectable elderly gentleman 
who appeared. And apparently he had, over th he had lots and lots of character witnesses that attested to his good, excellent character for the last 34 years. And certainly the old partnership had thought the world of him. They totally and utterly trusted him. It was just this Mr. Livesey that didn't seem to take an instant dislike to him. So that was a sad end to John after his career at the pit. But at least we get a, a bit of an insight into them and into the workings of the mine. So now we've come to the end of our story about Lower Maxwell Colliery. Uh, something that a few months ago we knew absolutely nothing about. And Lower Maxwood could have faded away into the mists of history and time of Bury, Haywood, Lancashire, English mining history. But it hasn't. And part of that is because people have helped us. So sometime, well, before we actually publish anything we'll put something up on our Facebook page sadly we can't uh, we can't get round to a, a website at present but I encourage you if there's anything you know about that subject even if it's just small we've had people tell us about Lomax Wood that they remember their dad taking them down picking coal down there it's valuable information and please check our Facebook page and we'll try to share things around the local groups and I, as I said that brings us to the end of the story of Lomax Wood Colliery where a near mining disaster happened where 17, 23 people underground should have died really but they were saved and 17 of them were saved because of the selfless actions of a group of men that remain unnamed and one man in particular whose valour I'm telling you now was outstanding going, under that, going up that tunnel with just his nostrils and his mouth out the water that guy today deserves the highest accolade there is so again thank you for watching <music>